Hallelujah. The Lord is risen. You know, you don't just have to say that on Resurrection Sunday. That is our victory every day. Our victory is in the fact that God was raised from the dead, that he is alive now and forevermore. We, we, are, we are a pitiful people, the Bible says, Paul writes, if Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. That is what sets us apart from every other ideology, religion, system of faith that exists on this planet that people use to try and get to God. What sets us apart is that our God, the one true God, died for our sins and was raised from the dead. Everybody else, you can go to their tombs and they're in there. Their bones are there. They're still dead. But our God is alive. He is resurrected and proven himself to be king and Lord of all. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, listen, family. I have an important word to deliver from the Lord tonight. But before we get into that, I just want to welcome everybody. It's good to see everybody. Do we have anybody here? It is your very first time here. You've never been to Legacy Family Church before? Or are we all family? We all family? All right, turn to somebody, give them a high five, say, what's up, family? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, listen, family, we got some announcements tonight. Uh, first, I want to remind everybody to be faithful in your tithes and your offerings. Let me tell you right now, when we give to the Lord and demonstrate through action that he is our supply, he comes through and continues to be our supply. He says he gives seed to the sower. That means that if you are a sower, he is going to give you seed. That is part of his promise to us. So as we give to the Lord, not because we want to get, but because why? We've already received. You wouldn't have anything to give unless God gave it to you in the first place. Amen? Amen. I remember when I was growing up, my dad always told us, now you guys make sure you give your offering. And here I am five years old. I got nothing to give. But my father would line us up by the door before we all piled into the van to go to church. And he'd walk down the line. And he'd, all, he'd give us all something. Some of it, he'd give us a dime, give us a quarter, give us a nickel, give you a dollar, whatever it was. He'd go down the line. He would put something in our hands so that when we went to church, he said, now give that to the Lord. All 14 of us. All 14 of us. Amen. He'd line us up, give us something. He said, now you give to the Lord. And he trained us to be tithers trained us to give offering, trained us to honor the Lord. See, that's what our Father does. He gives us something so that we can give back and prove that we've got faith in him. My Father put faith in us because we could have taken that and gone to the liquor store and bought gum and then sold it for 10 cents a piece and made a profit on it, which some little entrepreneur may have done once or twice. Only once or twice. A week. (laughs) But the point is this, is that my father trained us and gave to us so that we can give. And our father gives to us so we can give. So let's be faithful in God. And that God is so faithful to supply. Listen, he's so faithful, he supplies even to the wicked. He says he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. The sun shines on everybody because that's how good God is. Now, the unrighteous will not appreciate it, nor will they endure For very long. But we who know him, we can appreciate it every morning. Every morning we can look up at the sun and say, Lord, you're so faithful. The sun is always coming up and always setting. We know it. The rain comes when the righteous rule. Otherwise, there's a drought. Mm -hmm. But the Lord is faithful. So let's continue to be faithful. Um, A couple other announcements. Next Saturday, a week from today, we are having our annual rummage sale. All right, I appreciate y'all clapping, but here's why you get to clap. All that stuff that's in your house that you wanted to get rid of, you can get rid of it. You can bring it here on Wednesday night, and we will store it away and then put it out, and we will sell it. And we are selling it to raise money for our Roar Youth Camp and for our Vacation Bible School for the kids that is coming up this summer. So we are trying to make it so that VBS is free for any child that wants to come, and we want to keep the cost minimal for any of the youth that want to come to the Royal Youth Camp. We have kept it low 
year after year after year. Last year, it was only $50 to come to a four-day overnight camp for the youth because we did so well at this rummage sale. Last year, they raised, I think it was $6,000 at a rummage sale. Now, if you've ever done a, a yard sale or a rummage sale, you know you walk away with two or $300, you're happy. We raised $6,000 last year, and that was tucked away in a neighborhood where nobody knew any, where you were. Now, bless God, we're going to be here, and we got all this traffic. So, listen, we want everybody not just to bring your stuff, but to come out and help. We're going to be uh, selling all the things that are donated. We also have the men's ministry. They're going to be selling hot dogs and chips and drinks and everything to raise funds because we got a men's advance coming up this year. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Whoop, whoop. Amen. So I um, want you guys to, to come out and, and be a part of that. You, you can sell things. Anybody got that, that negotiator anointing? Like $50? No, you know, uh, $40. No, no, $45. Sold. Okay, good. We need you. That is a gift, and we appreciate it. We just got to release you. We want to release you into that gift right now. We also need gentlemen to help with security. You know, we are, we are blessed to be in this, in, in this area because there's a great need. As you guys know, there's, there's um, some, some personalities and some characters that like to traverse these streets. And, you know, we just want to let them know that uh, we, we love them. But if they step out of line, we will lay hands Old Testament style if need be. But in all seriousness, we need, we need some men to come out and help with, uh, help with security. Um, we, need, we need people that love, to, anybody love to draw and make like, bubble characters and all that stuff, make posters. We need help making posters, amen. All the ladies, come on. And some of you men, I know you all, you got it, you just try and hide it, but I know you can do it. But we need to make posters because we're gonna put the kids and, and an adult out on the corners and direct people in so they know where to come, so it's gonna be a great time. But remember, this is all for Roar Youth Camp and for VBS for raising the money. Now, uh, w another cool part is that Christ Community Church is gonna be joining us. So they're coming out, and they're going to be bringing a bunch of stuff to sell because they are going to be raising funds to redo the gym. How many of y'all have been inside the gym over there? Amen. Praise the Lord. It, it's, it's been used to serve the Lord. Amen. But they are raising funds so they can redo that gym. So we want to, we want to invite everybody out so that they can uh, sell their goods as well. And plus, it's just good to be together and partner churches coming together as one. So I want to encourage everybody uh, to be out there and be a part of that. Hold, uh, okay, hold on one second. I'm about to get there. So, um, so I want everybody to come out. Now listen, this Wednesday is the last time that you can bring your stuff out because Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're getting everything priced and labeled and set and ready to go. So I don't want like a big U-Haul truck Saturday morning dumped out and everything. That, that, that would not so much be a blessing to us. So if you can get here by Wednesday, 7 o'clock, we're going to be here so you guys can bring all, all your clothes. Um, my only request is that it's something that actually works, that's not broken. It's something that you wouldn't mind giving away or something. If you wouldn't buy it because of the condition it's in, assume nobody else would, and maybe it's better to, to go to the trash or something like that. Amen? All right. A um, couple other things real quick. Uh, we have our baptisms coming up. But I was telling everybody we have our, our baptisms coming up in June, but then I also mentioned we have our annual beach baptisms coming up in August. So everybody that was going to do it in June said, no, nah, I'll wait for the beach baptisms. That sounds nice. So we're going to do our beach baptism in August. That's the first Sunday in August. We all go out to Zuma Beach, and we, uh, we wrestle the waves out there. If you all been out there doing the beach baptisms, yeah, we are, we're earning that baptism. We're earning that anointing when we go out there. But it's a great time of just fun. We play football. We play tag. We play all types of stuff. Bring a, a sack lunch, a picnic style, and we're just going to spend the day out there together. So we're going to move our baptisms from June uh, to August. Amen? Amen? All right. And lastly, Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic. A couple weeks ago, we had Brother Alex Fitzgerald come, and we have been collecting bottles. You guys see the bottles in the back on the table there? The goal is to take those bottles and fill them up with change, with uh, money, with, with checks. My, my son Judah, he grabbed two bottles, went out to the neighborhood this week, just started knocking door to door and said, hey, this is what we're doing. We're raising money for Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic. It's a clinic that helps uh, uh, young girls and women who have unexpected pregnancies explore their options and, and gives them resources so they can keep their children. The boy raised over $250. 
over two hundred fifty dollars just walking around, talking to people. We have we have uh, another youth here that's got over six bottles filled. Filled six bottles in like a week and a half. Impressive. So with such a great start, I was like, you know what? We're all competitive here, so why not just capitalize on that? So we are now having a competition. Who can raise, number one, the most money, and number two, collect the most bottles? So you can get the most bottles, but it may not be the most money. You can get the most money, but it may not be the most bottles. But each of those winners is going to get a $50 gift certificate. Whoever brings in the most bottles and whoever brings in the most money. So here's the deal. You got to start tracking it because I'm not counting all the pennies, y'all. I got a lot of things I got to do. So I'll, I'll take your word for it. You count those jars, put, put the, your name and the amount that's in there, and then we'll see how many bottles were collected. All right? I know we got... We have one youth that has at least three bottles. We have another one that's got at least six. We've got a couple that got two. Anybody got more than six bottles filled up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Randy's like, now that you got $50 on it, I'm about to go. I'm going to everybody. Hey, but hey, nothing wrong with a little bit of friendly competition, right? So listen, let's continue to do that. Listen, Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic is actually doing the work. See, it's one thing to say, you know, overturn Roe v. Wade. Let's stop murdering children in the womb. But it's a completely different thing to now give these girls an option and give them help. And not just the young girls. One of the things I love about Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic is that they don't just address the young women. They address the young men who impregnated these women who need to be held accountable but also need to be encouraged that they can step up and be the young men that they're called to be. So they have a mentorship program for these young men. And according to Alex, when these young men get involved and step up to the plate, and say that they're going to be involved with the child and they want to, to be a father to this child, 80% of the time, the young girl will not go through with an abortion. They will make the decision for life instead. So these young men are a huge factor in making sure that these pregnancies go full term. Because the pressure on these young girls is immense. And the guy can just walk away, but she's left with that decision. So if we can get these young men. So, so gentlemen, consider being a mentor in this, in this program. You can go in and teach a class. You can go in and, and encourage a young man. Just show him the ropes. This is how you balance a checkbook. This is how you change a diaper. This is how you make a bottle. This is how you say, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is how you get a job. This is how you pay child support because you made that baby. All those things are important in making sure that we can preserve life. Every time an innocent Life is taken and blood is shed. A curse comes upon this nation. That's what the word says. That the blood of the innocent cries out to God. 60 million infants crying out to the Lord. If we have a chance to do something about it, we better take it. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, family. Those are all the announcements I have right now. So let's get into the word. Will you turn in your Bibles to Philippians and we're going to start at Philippians 2, verse 1. Would you stand with me as we read the word of God? Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, 
did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Father, as we come into your word tonight, we just ask that you would illuminate it to us. Grant us revelation of what your spirit is speaking to us now. Father, I offer myself as a vessel simply to communicate your truth, that we might grow thereby and become more and more, more like you, Lord Jesus, till we come to the fullness of the measure of Christ. We thank you, Lord God. We open up our hearts and our minds to receive. In Jesus' name and for your glory, amen. amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you on the topic of one mind. One mind. The idea of Christians being in one mind in one accord seems so outlandish at this point in our history. With thousands of denominations, with different emphasis on scripture, different expressions of worship, and some with even different definitions of Jesus, it is almost priced out of our mind that there could actually be oneness within the body of Christ. In fact, one of the greatest arguments that is brought to me when speaking with those who are yet to believe in Jesus is the apparent division within the body of Christ. If God is real, then how come there are so many versions of the Bible? How come there are so many different denominations? How come there are so many people who say this thing but believe this thing? As a matter of fact, if you speak with anyone in Islam, that is the first thing usually that they will bring up as evidence that this truly cannot be of one God because there are so many divisions amongst those who say they believe in him. And this truly is to our shame. However, things aren't always exactly what they appear to be. I believe that the body of Christ is not as divided as we think. Just as the children of Israel were the children of Israel, yet 12 tribes, 13 really, with Joseph being divided into Manasseh and Ephraim, 13 families that gathered together but called on the name of the same God. They all had their different issues. They all had their different jobs. They all had their different emphasis. But they were all one. And you mess with one, you got 11 tribes coming. In like manner, I also believe that some of what is thought to be division is merely a focus or an emphasis on a particular gift or particular mission that a select group of people have come together to accomplish. In this, they are like-minded. You have the Baptists, and while they may have difference of opinions, one of the, the huge things that is important to them is missions. They send out missionaries left and right. It is one of the, the great send-outs that they have every year at their national convention is the release of the missionaries who've been trained up for two years, and they are being sent out into the world to preach the gospel. They have an emphasis on that. They have an emphasis on the importance of baptism. Wonderful. But it's an, it's an emphasis. We, we see others who have an emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit. They want to see the, the power and the, the move of God in this time. Amen. Amen. Each with their own gift. But we've come to a place where it seems like it's impossible for us to be of one mind, because even though there may be a different emphasis, we will still argue on the minutia, on the 
what seems to be the little things. Sometimes it's not a little thing. The deity of Christ is not a little thing. Jesus is God, straight up. Anybody who says anything else, that's wrong. But I mean, how many times should we have communion? Oh, we got to have communion every Sunday. Oh, we take communion once a month. Oh, that's wrong. Well, Jesus had communion on the Passover. We're only supposed to have it on the Passover. Well, Jesus said as often as you, oh, but he was talking about just, can we just remember him in the taking of Holy Communion? Do we need to argue about that? Well, you, you, you have to be baptized. to be. Well, do you have to be baptized? Because isn't that of works? Because if now you're saying you have to be baptized in order to go to heaven, what about the man on the cross? He wasn't baptized. And we're getting into it. What did Jesus say? He said get baptized. If you have an opportunity to get baptized, just do what he said. We don't need to argue about it. Just go do what he said. We're thinking too much. That's part of the problem is we start thinking too much. Something my dad always said, boy, you're thinking. <laughs> he would tell me to do something, and then I start rationalizing in my head and asking questions. He's like, boy, you're thinking. Just do. God gave us 66 books with 1,189 chapters to take all the thought out of it. We read what he said and do what he said. It's that simple. But he also called us to be of one mind. To think the same thing. Isn't it interesting that there can be such division on big topics, little topics? And I'm not talking about things of no eternal consequence, like who's the best basketball player of all time? Everybody knows it's Michael Jordan, but somebody wants to throw LeBron out there, you know? Everybody knows. We're not talking about stuff like that. We're talking about real things that make an impact on how we live our lives, how we relate to God, and what we expect from him. Because what we expect from God determines how we react to him. And that determines what we live out here on earth. So it is important that we understand what he's saying and that we strive for what he's called us to do. Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, says something extremely extraordinary for us right now. But back then, it wasn't so extraordinary. And we'll see why in just a moment. In verse 2, going back to chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Just in those verses, he said mind five times. This is one of the principles that we, that we teach in reading and discerning the scriptures. Is when something is repeated over and over, it means that God is trying to tell us something. He says that we should be of one mind. That literally means the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we judge things should be similar. Let me take that back. Not just similar, should be the same. Should be the same. When we look at what happened in Texas this past week, I can't picture one human being that would not hear those names of those children and their heart not break. When I heard that, my heart broke. I thought of the parents. I thought of what they must be going through as this is happening in front of their eyes. Our hearts should break. I think we are of one mind, thinking the same in that. That same thought and feeling that we have about that, we should have that same thought and feeling about the things that are important to Christ, the things that Christ teaches us. Christ should not be divided. I want to go to several scriptures, and I want to emphasize just how much the Lord, through his apostles, instructed us to be of one mind. 
I'm just going to go real quick. So if you can get them up on the screen, cool. If not, don't worry about it. Romans 15, 6. The Lord writes through Paul, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Philippians 1, 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. When he says one mind, he'll also say the same mind. So in Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all Speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Philippians 3.16. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Everybody just say, same mind. Say one mind. Another way it's said in the scriptures is one accord. One accord. Turn to Acts. Well, I'm just going to read a bunch in Acts. We're going to go through Acts. Twelve times the word, the combination uh, one accord is used in the, in the New Testament. Ten of them are in the book of Acts. Now, the reason this is significant is because that in, in the book of Acts, we see the beginning of the church. The law of first mention tells us that when we see something first mentioned in the Bible, this shows God's original intent on how we should be operating and what God feels and thinks about that particular subject that is being mentioned. So with that being understood, Acts chapter 1, verse 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is in Acts chapter 1 as they were coming together in the upper room and they were praying together. They were in one accord. That word accord means the same mind, the same opinion, the same judgment. So it is the same thing as one mind. They were in one accord. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Acts 2, 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Acts 4, 24. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And over and over and over. So can we agree? Can we be in agreement that it is important to God as evidence through the emphasis of this type of oneness, that he desires that we would be of the same mind, of the same judgment, even speaking the same thing regarding the word of God. And not just the word of God, the things of life. Is that not what we just read? Raise your hand if you're not in agreement. I'll read everything again. Some of y'all raise your hands because you just, I said raise your hand, but that's all right. 
But God said that we can be of one mind, of one accord. That seems so impossible these days. There are so many different opinions that we share on different things. And I'll be honest, as someone who studies these, I, I study the different approaches to, to worship of God. I, I study the different opinions that people have on certain scriptures because I, I want to make sure that I'm following what Jesus said. And in my studies, this is what I found. When God says something in the scriptures, he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. I'm a simple guy. Very simple. I like to read something and then have it mean what it says. I think God wrote the scriptures so that guys like me can just read the Bible and say, thou shalt not kill. Now, God, how do you define that? He actually said, thou shalt not commit murder. So I don't need to think too much about that. Thou shalt not steal. He made that pretty simple. And while there are certain things that have a, a layer of mystery around them within the scriptures that do require study and understanding in order to get the deeper meaning, for the most part, you can read the Bible and take it at face value. And the reason I say take it at face value, and I'm emphasizing the reading and understanding of Scripture, is because that is the foundation of oneness of mind. If we are going to be of one mind, if we're going to think the same thing, then it is important that we get in alignment with the one who's doing the thinking. Who is the head of the church? Jesus. Y'all hesitated. It's not Jesse, just so you know. Jesse is not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Amen. So what Jesus says we should be, what we should do, how we should operate, the order that we should have, the structure that should be in place, the things that should be taught, the things that should be emphasized, the things that we should do, the things that we should not do, they come directly from the head. Remember, we are talking about being one body. Christ is the head, and it is our job to respond to the head. He has, he has a system of communication by means of the Holy Spirit by which he will speak to us and we can respond with obedience. He is not sending mixed signals. Amen? Amen? Jesus is not saying this is true to one person and this is true to another person and then expecting you all to fight it out. No. God is not divided in himself, nor is he the author of confusion. So if, if one person says, I heard from the Lord, and he said this, and another one says, I heard from the Lord, they can, and they're contrary to one another, they can not both be true. They can one be true and one be wrong, or they can both be wrong, but they can not both be true. And unfortunately, in our culture, we love this subjective truth. We love this post-truth culture that says that how you feel is more important than what is real. And therefore, you get to establish your truth. Oh, well, that's your truth. No, my brother, two plus two is four. You go ahead and say it's seven all you want, but you're going to get a call from the IRS at the end of tax season because something's going to be wrong. Truth is objective. There's not your truth. You can have an opinion about something in regards to preference, but when it comes to principle, God establishes truth, and he alone. No one else has any say in that. Anybody else who has an opinion about God and what he says about truth, I'm sorry, they don't matter. Amen. Did they create the universe? Nope. Did they set the stars in the sky? Do they call them all by name? Can they measure the universe in the span of their hand? Do they know the number of on of hairs on everyone's head? Mine's a little bit easier to count. No, it is God. Turn to John chapter 17. We're going to be on this for just a couple of weeks, but I want to lay a solid foundation here tonight. Thank you, brother. Everybody set your watches to 10 p.m. 
I'm going to take my time. Y'all can thank Brother Harold for that. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. John chapter 17. I love John chapter 17. In, in, in the book of Matthew, we see the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. But in John 17, we see the Lord praying. And we get to see this is how Jesus prays. And within this, we see his earnest desire for the oneness. He, he begins to pray for the unity of the church in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. Now listen to this. He's saying they're going to believe that you sent me when those who believe on account of the apostles are one with us. Listen, that means one in every way, but especially in mind and in spirit. I cannot be one with the apostles, for they are long since dead. But I can be one with the teachings of Christ that came through them by being in agreement with them. This is how the oneness plays out. That we are in one mind, in agreement about the things that Jesus taught. About the things that he emphasized. This is part of how they know that we believe in Jesus and that Jesus was sent by God. Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. That they may be one just as we are one together. So listen. Do you think Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are up there arguing about how often people should have communion? Do you think they're having a deep theological discussion on whether you need to be baptized or not? Do you think they're having a deep discussion on the validity of abortion or if there's any circumstance under which God thinks it's okay? Are they having a disagreement up there about that? No. They're in one mind, one accord. And then he's praying for us to be the same. I would venture to say that Jesus gets his prayers answered. Wouldn't you? Verse 23. I in them, in you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you love me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that, I, that you have sent me. And I have declared to them your name. And will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. What a powerful prayer that centers around his desire for us all to be one. The idea that Father God can speak to us by the Holy Spirit, that we would know his thoughts his plans, his heart, how he feels about things, and then we can represent that here on this earth is absolutely amazing. But what's even more amazing is when those who call on the name of the Lord are all hearing the same thing, speaking the same thing, and are of one mind and one accord. The greatest trick Satan has ever pulled is to get those things which are to be one to look at each other as an enemy. That was his first tactic in the garden. God made Adam and Eve to be one. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And for this reason shall a man leave his mother and father and be joined unto his wife, 
and the two shall become one flesh. That was God's design. The very next verse, here comes Satan to separate the oneness. He's always trying to separate the oneness. Because when we come together in one mind and one accord, we are so powerful together. We are so powerful. But when there's division and we're not one, man, we're as clumsy as all get out. We're tripping over each other, can't walk straight. It, 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 it really is pitiful. But can you imagine if those who believe in Jesus could come together and have the same mind? I believe it's possible. I believe it's possible that we could have the same mind. Now, that doesn't mean that we'd have the same reaction to the information. Some people are called to be a little bit more loud and bold. Other people are called to be a safe place for people to rest. Some people are called to be on the front line. Some people are called to be on the back line to take care of those who are coming off the front line. But our hearts should all feel the same. We should all be able to recognize certain things. Number one, we should be able to recognize who Jesus is and how he thinks. Number two, we should be able to recognize the enemy when we see him. See, that was the first problem in the garden. They didn't recognize the enemy. Came in talking sweet. Smooth words. Making big promises. Oh, yeah, you be like God. Like, wait a minute, didn't he already say I was made in his likeness and in his image. But the enemy comes in. See, that's part of the problem is we can't recognize the enemy because he's got us so confused. The key to that prayer, starting at verse 20, actually begins back in verse 13. John 17, verse 13. I'm going to give you the key to our oneness right here. Not I, but the Lord. He said it. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, that one that's always trying to bring division, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Remember, he just mentioned something twice here. That means it's an emphasis. It means it's important. Verse 14, I have given them your word. 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Who did God send into the world? According to this scripture, God sent Christ into the world. Who is Jesus? John 1.1. 1, 1, the word. God sent the word. When he wanted to create the world, he sent the word. When he wanted to save it, he sent the word. God sent the word. Now, Jesus just said, as you have sent me, I now also send them. What did he send us with? I've given them your word. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Listen, family, this is so important. I say it all the time. But it's worth saying every time. The word of God is the foundation of our unity of the spirit and our one mindedness. It is the word of God that establishes our thoughts. It is the word of God that washes and cleanses us. It is the word of God that establishes how we should act, think and feel. The word of God is what sets my mind on every single topic and every single subject that I encounter. It is the word of God that determines how I love my wife, 
how I raise my children, how I spend his money, how I operate in his church, how I drive the car, how I treat a stranger, how I eat, what I eat, how much I eat, how I take care of my vessel. Every aspect of my life comes down to the word of God. Let me tell you this. Every argument and every point of division that exists, not just within the body of Christ, but within humanity as a whole, comes down to his word. It is undeniable. Every single argument, every single debate comes down to this. Is there a God and what did he say? Everything. Oh, they're having a a debate about the economy and taxes. Guess what? Economy and taxes comes down to, is there a God, and what did he say about it? Marriage. Well, I believe the marriage is, uh, you, you know, should be open. No. Who is God, and what did he say about marriage? That is truth. Well, I believe there's 327 genders. And he made them. Male and female, he made them drop moment there are two there are two now I appreciate that there are things that happen in people's lives that would cause a level of confusion there's rejection that happens in people's lives that gets them looking to be accepted I understand rapid onset gender dysphoria when their friends everybody thinks they're non-binary so now they just want to be non-binary too because that's what people do it's just like my favorite rock group is over here oh well I'm gonna like like them too That's just a part of the human condition. I understand that. But the bottom line is, it matters not what you think. What matters is what God thinks, what is on his mind, and is reflected and revealed in his word. In his word. Like I said earlier, he took all the thought out of it so that we can be of one mind. The problem is, is that we start thinking too much. I was walking, watching a documentary the other day, and I was sitting there shaking my head for two and a half hours because we have people who've got three or four PhDs and trying to tell everybody that Jesus isn't the only way. And they call themselves Christians. They call themselves progressive. They call themselves the emergent church. And they're sitting there deconstructing the faith And making claims that if anyone is certain of what they're saying, then that is a sign that you need to get away from them. Certainty is an enemy in the mind of the emergent and progressive church. These are people with doctorates. If you're certain of anything, then that's a a sign that you're on the wrong track. No, I'm certain of this. Number one, you're crazy. And number two, I am certain that what God says is true. I am certain of that. I'm certain that God is not a liar. I'm a certain that he can watch over his word to perform it. I'm certain that he wrote this book, 40 different authors on three different continents, three different languages over 1,500 years, and all with a unifying message that cannot be done by man. Only God can do that. I am certain of that. I'm certain that the God who created us knows better about how we should live than we do ourselves. I'm certain of that. But see, we want to get away from objectivity. We want to invite subjectivity because now that means, in effect, you are now God. And see, this is where division comes from. It's when everybody starts thinking they're God. Knowledge puffs up in his hearty. Every great heresy has come from a great seminary school. I'll tell you that right now. What happens is, is people start thinking so much, and then the more you think, the more you think you know. And then when you start thinking you know everything... Now you start making stuff up in order to distinguish yourself from other people who know the same thing you do. Because now you're not special. So now I need to come up with some revelation that no one's ever heard before. I was watching some guy in the pulpit the other day, and he was talking about how Adam, God breathed the blood of Jesus into Adam. And as a result of that, Adam was God, and we are little gods. I'm like... No, I've read through this Bible 12 times. I've never seen that before. You a lie. 
you a lie, this is truth. But why, do, why would people say such audacious things when it's not written in the scriptures? And they, want, they think they're going to get away with it. They want to be God. They want the preeminence. Paul writes about people like that. But praise the Lord, we have the word in the simplicity of the gospel. Praise the Lord, we have the word of God to hold us accountable and to teach us truth from error. Praise the Lord that we can be simple enough to just believe his word. See, this is why we have to come to him like a child. I love every stage of development of my children. I've got 24 to 3 years old. And I'm looking at these little ones. I learned so much about God from them. It's amazing. And I learned so much about what God expects from me. My little one, Genesis, comes up. Daddy, can we, you know, go to the park? Not right now, baby. Okay, Daddy. I said, but we'll go another day. Comes up to me next day. Daddy, we go to the park today? Not today. We'll, we'll go the next day. Okay. Daddy, we going to the park today? We're going to the park today. Yay! We're going to the park. Never a doubt whether we were going to the park or not. She just wanted to know when. She didn't sit there and try and rationalize and talk to me. Well, 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 Dad, can we talk about what a park actually is? Because when I say park, I mean Disneyland. That's what I'm thinking when I say park. No, it was just simple. A simple request. I told her yes, told her when, and she believed me. And we went. That, that was it. Can we, can we just believe God? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. God said, you're going to be a father of many nations. He's 75 years old. He said, okay, I believe you. 25 years goes by. Nothing happened. Still believes him. Has one son of promise. One out of promise, one son of promise. He says, well, I've only got one son, but I guess at some point I'm going to have as many children as there are sands on the sea and stars in the sky, because God said so. And here we are today, sons and daughters of faith. Abraham's faith. We believe God. I want to share with you six quick things on how we get out of unity of mind. How we get out of unity of mind. I want to start with some of the, some of the easy ones, and I'm just going to move quickly through these. Number one, we will overemphasize a subject in the word. Sometimes we get so passionate about one particular aspect of who God is that we will overemphasize that and, and make it a part of everything we talk about. For example, uh, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit today. I see nothing within the Bible that says they stop. I know that there's some people who would disagree with me, but I don't see any scriptures that says the, the fruits of the Spirit, I mean the, the gifts of the Spirit will stop at such and such time. Uh, the Bible even says to, to ask and desire for the greater gifts. So that's what I believe. I believe that praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, laying hands, and seeing healings happen. I believe that that is for today as the Spirit wills, not as we desire to make ourselves super spiritual and begin fabricating things. But I know it happens because I've seen it happen. I've been used in those areas, and I've seen God use others in those areas in my life and in my family. It is the real deal. But we will take that praying in the Spirit... And then we will overemphasize it so much when it is simply a gift that is ministered as the Spirit leads and now make it a demand for everyone who is a Christian. I've heard people from the pulpit say, if you don't pray in tongues, you're not even saved. The problem is we just overstep the boundaries and the Bible doesn't say that. Nowhere does it make speaking in tongues a requirement to be saved, nor does it make it a requirement to be filled with the Spirit. I know a lot of great pastors who do not have the gift of praying in tongues, but don't tell me they're not filled with the Spirit. They are full of the Spirit. They most certainly are. But what happens is if we start overemphasizing one particular part, we start setting ourselves against other people. 
So we, we got to make sure that we don't overemphasize aspects of the word. Um, number two, we can overemphasize a group. Overemphasize a group. We are the Baptists. We are the Methodists. We are the Presbyterians. We are the this. Uh, so now, if you're not one of us, eh, y'all are going to get spewed out of Jesus' mouth. Everybody thinks they're the Church of Philadelphia. Everybody thinks they're the church above reproach. Everybody thinks that. So what happens is we start lining up with a, a group of people, and they, oh, you can't, they, they don't know Jesus. Well, Mark 9, chapter 38, Jesus addresses this very thing. The disciples are out there, and they see a guy who believes in Jesus just like they do, but because he's not rolling with this particular group of disciples, they're like, hey, man, stop casting out demons. Jesus is like, what? If he's casting out demons in my name and he believes in me, leave him alone. They're like, well, he wasn't walking with us. He doesn't have a Legacy Family Church shirt on. So he, get out of my territory. Canoga Park is ours. Get up out of here. Don't you dare cast that demon out of that person. No, you're getting caught up in the group. You're getting in groupthink. No, we are, we are a part of his church. We are the church universal. If they call on the name of the Lord Jesus, the true Jesus, we're going to talk about that next week. They call on the real Jesus, the one who died, rose again, seated at the right hand of the Father, offers forgiveness of sins to those who repent, who wrote this word and everything about this word we believe. That Jesus, we're good to go. Let them be. So don't get so caught up in the group and in the click. Like, yeah, this is my crew. I love my church. Look, I have no problem with I love my church. But it just kind of carries that connotation like, yeah, we're better than you. Doesn't it? When you guys see those signs, don't you kind of think that? You're like, oh, well, I'm going to get an I love my church. You know? I like, let's just say I love the church. Because I love all the churches. I'm not, I'm not coming against the bride of Jesus I know how I feel if anybody would try and step to my wife. You're in trouble. Why would I attack the wife of Jesus? You know what I'm saying? So it's not about that. It's just about following the word of God, appreciating where he has us, but appreciating where he has all of his members. Number three, you start focusing on man. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 real quick. This one I do want to read. Because I'll tell you, of all of these things that I'm sharing right here that are on the, the softer side of what goes wrong with our one-mindedness and our one accord, this is the most troublesome because I believe, personally, that it is the most prevalent in our culture right now, given the direction of our media and how our culture has been framed now through media Verse 1, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. So just so you know, Paul's not happy. He's, he's laying into them right now. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So he's, he's giving them the rundown. You guys are carnal. You're acting just like men. You're like little babies. What is it that is driving him to make this statement? Here it is. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to, one, uh, to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. We have too many people worshiping pastors. We got some serious pastor worship going on. And in... 
it, both are to blame. We got pastors that want to be worshipped. And you can tell by the way they carry themselves. By the way they distance themselves. from They want to be that celebrity. And that's trouble. But then we have people who want a celebrity. They want a celebrity. They're no different than the children of Israel when they had God as their king. And they said, give us a king like everybody else. Give me a famous pastor like the world has famous celebrities. Give me one that, that's a charismatic and looks like a model. I want one of those because the world has those and they can ooh and ah over them. I want to I ooh and ah and I want to be able to show everybody, see, that's my pastor. See, he got the, he got the skinny jeans. He got the fresh haircut. He got the nice car. He got the Barbie doll wife. He, he, he's got the big lights in the church. He's got the, he's got the Cadillac. He's got the Bentley. Ooh, he's hanging out with other celebrities. Oh, my goodness. You see that picture of him with Jay-Z? He must be anointed. But then what happens? No, I'm not saying that everybody who wears skinny jeans or everybody who has a fresh haircut, you guys understand what I'm saying. Get your fresh haircut and go ahead and rock them skinny jeans. It's all good. You have, have your style. That is all right. But you know what I'm saying. There seems to be a formula. There seems to be a manner in which certain people have figured out you can build the church by behaving and taking on certain characteristics. And you guys know what I'm talking about. We see it. Get the young pastor Get everybody up on the stage that looks like they're, you know, in People magazine. Be, be sure you get yourself a worship album out and start pumping that thing. Write yourself a book. Set up several conferences. Get your lights. Do the big thing. You're set to go. Listen, I know how it works. Been there, done that. But the problem is, is that the emphasis is about man. You start following a man. Ooh, did you hear what someone so said? You got more people quoting pastors than they are quoting the scriptures. The word of God is life. Not what I say. This is why one of the rules that I have is don't ever say what Jesse said. What power is there in what I said? You got, the funniest thing to me is when people like quote themselves on their own like Facebook page. <laughs> say something like wise and they put Jesse Bailey. I'm like, you don't have to put your name on it if you just said it on your own page. Why are you quoting yourself? Because that's how you get followers. That's how you get famous. You don't need to do that. So the people encourage man worship, and then we look to worship, man. Please look to worship Jesus. Because every man will fail you. I will fail you. I will disappoint you. I will rub you the wrong way. I'm a human being. That's what happens. Amen. You're going to get to know me and be like, oh, he's kind of normal. Yeah. I'm very normal. I get mad. I get tired. You know, I, I, I mess up. I leave my socks on the ground. I do the whole thing. Pastor Jesse's not perfect. Far from. Anybody who gets up there acting like they're perfect, mm, come on now. I got stuff I need to work on. I just have a particular gift that God wants me to use so that you can be encouraged and grow in Christ. I'm just doing my job. Amen. But don't worship man. That goes into number four, and that is found in James chapter four. You don't have to turn there, but selfish ambition. Sometimes we get so focused on self and what we want that we are willing to overlook or to change what God has said so it lines up with what we want. See, self is the ultimate enemy. It's not the devil. The devil's already been defeated. The devil's already under our feet. Satan was beat 2,000 years ago on the cross. Checkmate. You're done. Amen. The only thing we have left to deal with is our self. When self dies, the enemy's got no way in. So when we get selfish ambition coming in, and we're worried about what we get and what we want, and we take our emphasis on what Christ is calling us to do in the greater good, 
looking out not for our own interests, but the interests of others, when we get into that mindset, now we start altering the word of God. Let me get controversial if I can. Well, why wouldn't God want women to be pastors in the pulpit if they have a gift to teach? Why, wouldn't, why would God give someone a gift to teach if he didn't want them in the pulpit? Well, God said in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that he does not permit women to teach or have authority over men. So this we know. This is the truth. But I understand that because of the oppression that has been in the world, particularly towards women, that can sound like just another oppressive thing that was written in an archaic book in order to further press you down and to keep God from using his gift. That's not what that meant. My question is, if God wanted to say that he doesn't want, it's not a woman's role to be pastoring and teaching from the pulpit, what would he say then? If he said, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, what would God say if he did not want that? How would he communicate that? Well, he would say that he didn't want them to teach. Okay. That is a truth. That is a hard truth. Do I know exactly why? No. Do I need to? No. This is what God said. One of the, one of the reasons why is because God has order, and he wants everything in the church to reflect his order. God is the head of the church. The church is the bride. So if, if God is the head, then he is the teacher, and we respond to him. He wants that reflected in everything. This is why husbands are the head of the household. This doesn't mean we're better. It just means that this is the role that we have been designed to take. That is our role. It is God-given. It is not a place of privilege. It is a place of service. And it's not easy, ladies, just so you know. It's not, e it's not easy that everything is your fault. Everything that happens in my household is my fault. I have to own that. If my wife is, up, is upset, that's my fault. And I got to own it. That's a result of my leadership or lack thereof. I got to own that. When Eve ate of the fruit, God didn't go to her. He went to Adam because it was his fault. So take that off of Eve, y'all. That wasn't her fault. Adam failed. He dropped the ball. Period. But that's the role that we've been given. But because we live in this culture that is now driven by wokeness and feminism and uh, equity and equality, we look at a scripture like that, and though it is plainly written, we reject it and want to rewrite it to suit ourselves. And as a result, we see miscommunication. We see a disjointedness within the body. And that is a reality. I know it is not comfortable to hear, but that's what the Bible says. I'm not a, you know how easy would it, it would be for me to just start ordaining women pastors? I mean, everybody would just, oh my gosh, look at that. That is so awesome. I'd be, I'd be right in there with culture. But the reality is there's no, nothing more oppressive than putting someone in a position that God didn't design for them. That's actually oppressive. That's oppressive. Same thing with men. Men, you don't get to stay, be a stay-at-home husband. I was talking with the discipleship group the other day. I saw some TikTok video with some man talking about how he gets up every morning and makes his wife chocolate chip pancakes before she goes to work, and he naps during the day and cleans the house and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, boy, who's your daddy? That's the most, that's nonsense. You're going to wake up one day and she's going to be gone because she can't respect that. Woman can't respect a man who won't put his hands to the plow and get out there and hustle and get it done. That's what we're supposed to do. Amen. Trying to reverse roles. That's what Satan did to start this whole problem is reverse roles. That's a harsh truth. But if we just want what's comfortable for us, we'll change it. We will change what God said. But we got to trust that he knows better and that he loves us. And that when we do things God's way, we get his best. Number five, ignorance of the word. If you don't know the word, 
then you just believe anything that anybody stands up here and says. God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> you know when people quote that like it's a scripture? He never said that. The whole gospel is built on the fact that we could not help ourselves. We were lost. We were enemies of God. We didn't even know we needed help. And he came down anyway. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God helps those who help. That's ignorance of the word. You, you don't know what it said. This is why we have to be readers of the word. I, I, I pray that you all have time in the Bible every day. Listen, every day. You're like, ooh, that's a lot. Really? Go check your phone and see how much you're on YouTube. I, I love that little feature on there. You can be like, look at the app, how many hours are spent. I get that on my kids all the time. Found one of them, was on YouTube for six hours one day. Six hours. Now, granted, this, this particular one, it's all like learning stuff and history, but I'm like, that's still six hours on a nap. How many hours are you on Facebook? Okay, can you take 30 of those minutes and read the Word of God, please? Can you take 30 minutes and talk to your Heavenly Father? Because He will lead you and guide you into all truth. He'll tell you this stuff Himself, so you don't have to take mine or anybody else's word for it. He wants to communicate with you. So be in the Word and be in prayer. Thank you. Last. You can be ignorant of the word, but then you can just straight up ignore the word. And this is just pride. You see the word, you know what the word says, but you make a conscious decision to ignore it. That, family, is rebellion. It's rebellion. When you know what the word of God says, but you consciously choose to ignore it, you are in rebellion against God. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 14 that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's witchcraft. Witchcraft is trying to manipulate someone is ultimately what it means. So when you rebel against God and try and justify yourself, you're trying to manipulate God. You're trying to perform witchcraft on God and his word when you rebel against it and try and do things your way because you think you know better, or you want to reinterpret what God says when the Bible is clear that no scripture is up to anyone's private interpretation. God said what he meant and meant what he said. Family, the key to being of one mind is that we read this word and say it is true, and that's that. It's not complicated, is it? It's not always easy because, remember, God is trying to get us to be our, nat uh, our, our supernatural self. And our natural self is going to resist this. So when you read the word of God and you don't want to hear it, just know that that is your natural self resisting the supernatural truth of God. That's okay. We all go through it. But as Jesus said to Paul when he knocked him down on the ground on the road to Damascus, it's hard to kick against the goads. It's hard to keep running your head up against the truth. Eventually, you're just going to have to break and realize this is true. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about some specific lies that the enemy has brought in to cause division. We're going to talk about some specific doctrines of demons that are floating around in order to draw us away from one-mindedness, draw us away from being like-minded, the same mind of one accord, because that's what the enemy does. He comes to bring division, to diminish our power and our authority. But thanks be to God, we have his word, we have his spirit, and we can always turn to him. Amen. Family, will you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, it is your desire that we would be of one mind, one accord, like-minded, of the same mind, Father, if that is your desire, that is our desire too. And we want to search for that. We want to strive for that. We want to find that. We want to be that example to the world. Lord, you said in your prayer that this is how they would know that you are sent, that we would be one with one another, and that means the same mind. So, Father, I pray that in this household right here, let it begin with us, that we would be of the same mind in one accord within our families, between husband and wife, between children and parents, 
that there would be one-mindedness, Lord God, that you would erase any divisions, that you would bring us all back to the knowledge of the truth, to your word, which is truth, and that would be the solid rock on which we stand. Not what culture says, not what our feelings say, and certainly not what the enemy is speaking. But what you and you alone say, Lord God, let us turn back to you. Father, we repent for exalting any other voice in our life that would speak to us and declare a truth that is contrary to what you have written in your holy writ. Father, we ask right now that you would wash us and cleanse us by the washing of the water of the word. That you would regenerate our hearts and minds. That you would make us sensitive to the things of the spirit and quick to obey what is written in your word. Father, unite us together as a church family here at Legacy. I pray, Lord God, that we would think the same thing. That we would understand your truth the same way. That we would recognize your truth truth, and recognize error, too. That, Father, we would know your truth so well that when error came in, we would know that. Our desire is to be one with you. If we're one with you, we will be one together. So, Father, I pray that you would humble us too. I pray this for me, Lord. Lord, if there is anything in my heart that I have exalted above you, Lord, would you humble that? Father, if there is any ignorance, if there's any ignoring, if there's any selfish ambition, Lord, if there's any overemphasis, if there's any focus on man, If there's any focus on gifting, if there's anything, Lord God, that would pull us away from that oneness, please, Lord God, have your way, expose it in us, transform us, Lord God, and and mold us into who you want us to be. For your glory, Lord, not for our sake. We We are saved by your grace, but Father, this is for your glory. While we're here on earth, there is a job for us to do, and it is to 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 reflect you here to the world. So, Father, please remove anything that would keep us from being anything less than a beautiful reflection of you. We thank you for that, Lord God. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone in agreement said, amen. Amen. All right, family. Now, as I look around, I'm looking at all these beautiful faces. And this I know. You all know Jesus. Amen. Amen. So that being the case, as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I challenge you all, let's go out into the world and preach the gospel. Freely you've received, now freely give. Give to the people around you. This world, this world has turned upside down. And you are the answer. Literally, you. Not just the collective you, but the individual you. You are the answer. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are the ones that have been chosen to go out and represent Christ. So having such a great commission, go in the power of the spirit and function in all boldness. Deny self. Grab hold of the life of Christ. And be a witness to everyone that you come in contact with. You're going to get those people that gnash their teeth at you. But you know what? You're also going to get the ones who fall down on their knees. Go and sow the seed. Water that which has been sown. And watch God get the increase. Stand to your feet. I want to pray and release you. As you go out, please remember, Open Arms Pregnancy Clinic. Let's get those bottles filled. Remember, most bottles collected and must, most money raised. We're having that competition. Also, don't forget, baptisms are moved to, to August. And then, I forgot, when's the last time to bring all that beautiful stuff that you want to get rid of in your house? Wednesday. Wednesday. Amen. So you guys bring it Wednesday and then be here next Saturday so we can sell all this stuff. Tell everybody in your neighborhood we're going to put it on Craigslist. Um, We're going to be releasing it on on Facebook, and it's on the website and everything. So 7 o'clock on Wednesday, you can drop everything off, and then we will be here. Now, you guys listen to this. We'll be here Saturday morning at 6 a.m. to set up. We open at 7 a.m. 
sell till 2 p.m. Hopefully we'll sell it before noon and we can get off early. But we'll be here till 2 and then clean up till 3. So what I would love is to have some people that would be willing to be here at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then some people that would be waiting, willing to help us clean up till 3. Now, y'all don't leave me hanging. I don't want to be here at 6 a.m. alone and then here at 3 p.m. alone. Oh, dang, it got quiet. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I just pray for the conviction of the Holy Ghost to wake them up at 5.30 on Saturday morning. In Jesus' name, no. All right, family, let's lift our hands to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us tonight through your word. Your word is truth. Lord, as we go out from here, we thank you that we are your ambassadors, that we are your ministers of the gospel, and that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit, that we can go out and bear witness to you in this community, that you might be glorified and souls might be saved. So, Father, we thank you for sending us out right now. We go in the power of the Spirit, the boldness of the Spirit, with our words seasoned with grace to witness you to a lost and hurt and broken world. Father, we continue to pray for those who lost their lives in Uvalde. We pray for every family that's been impacted by this. We pray for the community. Lord, we pray for this nation as yet another tragedy looks to divide us, Lord. Father, come in and bring your wisdom. Come in and bring your mercy. Come and bring your comfort and your compassion during this time, Lord God. We need you more and more. We need you. Help us to be agents of that healing in our circles of influence, Lord. We thank you so much. We love you. We give you all the praise. And I thank you for your peace, your protection, your provision over every household. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Love you guys. Have a great week. We will see you Wednesday night.